Okay, mic test. We're checking our technicals here. I don't understand why my TikTok title doesn't always change. Maybe because I don't know which part to change. But welcome, everyone. So today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics of all time, and that is about building confidence. So I'd like to invite our folks who are viewing this live session. If you have any questions about how can I speak more confidently at work, whether it's for my meetings, whether it's for a job interview, whether it's with someone that I have a conflict with at work, it could be a pitch for a client, it could be whatever it is that you think is an issue involving holding back, you wanting to say something, but you just can't express using the right words. And maybe because you're afraid of people's judgments or maybe because you're afraid of failure. So we're going to open the floor for those questions. In the meantime, while we're doing, uh, while we're waiting for people to settle down, may I request an attendance check? Could you please give me an exclamation mark in the chat? I have a lot of uh, screens happening at the same time. I'm in my bedroom, by the way. So I have here, this camera is my TikTok camera. Here is my YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And here is my Instagram uh, camera as well. So would love to see, give me your city, your province, your country, your industry, or your company where you're typing from. Also, by the way, if you're typing something that involves sensitivity, meaning it involves conflict with someone at work, may I request that you take out your name and your photo? Because if I read your question and they're going to be displayed publicly, some folks might find out that you're referring to them. So please take it out. But I think today's topic is going to be safe it's going to be about how to speak more confidently at work okay by the way it doesn't have to be about work it could be about anything like i don't know if you're joining a beauty pageant for example how do you speak more confidently answering those q a if you're about to sell something to another client whether you're from insurance you're from real estate or you're a student about to defend their thesis how can you speak more confidently? So I would love to collect those answers from all of you. All right. Looking at the chat box now, let's look at some people's responses here. Uh, Evelyn is from LinkedIn, typing from London. I don't know how to pronounce this properly, so I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name. Name is Imbogo from Uganda. Thank you for joining us. Jenny is from Davao, city banking industry. Nelson is watching from Kuwait as an admin officer. Okay, uh, all the way from Antique, Memorial Campus, Tario Le Memorial Campus, uh, Darius is also here. Thank you. Okay, people are already typing their questions, by the way. I'll get to that in a while. Ella is from Makati. Mikael is from, Mikael just saying hello. Denver from LinkedIn is from Laguna. Thank you. Gimau, Arlene is watching from Dubai. From, Air, from Dubai Airport Customer Service. Dubai is an amazing airport, by the way. So efficient airport. Uh, Karen's from Davao City. Onyate Den is watching from Hinigara, Negros Occidental. Jeremy says hello. Uh, Dep et Iriga in Camarina Sur. Okay. You know, here's my request because I'm streaming, by the way, from StreamYard. It will be amazing if StreamYard is able to use also TikTok and Instagram for live. Because right now, those two apps, their APIs are not connected and they're not allowing yet third parties to connect with them. So right now, I'm only using YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook efficiently through StreamYard. But it would be great if I get to consolidate everything into one screen. Okay, so I would love to hear your questions now. By the way, we're also going to be giving away some prizes in today's session. Speaking of confidence, I will be giving away some tickets to our upcoming workshop happening on April 28, uh, sorry, 29. And then I'm also going to be giving away some gift certificates from our sponsor, and that is Oso oh Healthy Snacks. And these are guys who make dried fruits and vegetables, and it makes it feel like it's all crunchy chicheria, as we all know in the Philippines. And yet, they're all healthy because they're gluten-free and they're baked, not fried. We'll be giving away 500 peso gift certificate also for our participants. All right. So 
I would love to see your answers now. Uh, ooh, okay. We're starting to get some questions here. Let me call out for some folks because we have lots of attendance check here. Bervik is from Makati saying hello. Philip is watching from Copenhagen. Thank you for joining us. Sasha is from Malaysia. Thank you also for joining us. Janine is a nurse manager from Quezon City. Thank you for joining us. Fred is from Cebu. Rain is from Muntinlupa City. Okay. All right. Are you guys ready? Okay. Let me... Let me read some questions now. I have... Ooh, okay. So here's a question. This one's from YouTube. I'm going to call out YouTube because we don't have a lot of viewers yet on YouTube. So this is a question from Mendel. And Mendel's question is, John, I have a tendency to say a lot of ums and ah whenever I present during a meeting. Or usually when we're able to... Our LinkedIn connection, by the way, has been taken out. Sorry for that. We're going to return it in a while. Okay, there you go. Our there you go. Our LinkedIn is back. Sorry for that, guys. So question is, how do I avoid ums and us so I can speak more confidently or at least appear to be more confident? Okay, this is a classic one. First and foremost, you have to embrace that saying ums and ah uh, is a part of life. I do that also. The only difference is I try to minimize it because the more you say it every 30 seconds or every one minute, it becomes irritating, especially for the listeners, right? So I recommend you three things. Number one, instead of ums and ah, uh, do a strategic pause. Just pause instead. So instead of saying, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say, um, uh, um, instead of saying that, say something like, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say, so you see what I did there? Sometimes just to make it more theatrical for the audience to think that you are thinking, because sometimes they might not know that you're not doing anything during that five second pause, I would sometimes tilt my head just for them to know that I am thinking. Or instead of doing a simple pause, it is less irritating if you extend the last syllable of the word. So for example, Ladies and gentlemen, what we all need is love. And I think, um, uh, so instead of doing that, I would say, ladies and gentlemen, all we need is love. And I think, I do think, so that is less irritating. And you're still showing to the other person that you're trying to buy time to think out loud. Okay. The third, what I would do is to buy time. And again, this might take this might depend on your personality, right? One way is while you're answering the question, you can throw first the question to the other members of the participants. So, for example, you don't know what you're about to say. You were asked the question, uh, John, why do you think bitcoins should be regulated by all governments? So I would say something like, I think bitcoins should be regulated because... Um, uh, instead of doing that, say something like, I think Bitcoin should be regulated because, well, before I answer this question, I'd love to ask people's opinions first. What do you think of it? And then you can share your opinion afterward. It's a tactic we're in because you deflect it to someone else. You use the time to buy time for your answers. Now, I will not recommend this all the time because it's a used and abused tactic such that if you do it, some people will know that you're just buying time because you don't know the correct answer. Okay? I would use it if I'm desperate. I would use it if you think you're so confident that it appears that you already know the answer. It's just that you're curious first to know what the other people would say. Okay? But if I were to choose among the options I gave, if I were to choose just one answer, I would just do a strategic pause. I would tilt my head. Sometimes I would do something like, hmm... Sometimes that could be a theatrical act. Again, it depends on your personality. And then I would say it rather than saying ums and ahs too many times. Okay? All right. Let's... This time I'm going to show a question here. Nelson is asking, by the way, our participants from Instagram and LinkedIn, unfortunately, you will not be able to see the questions displayed on the screen. 
we show that on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Insta and YouTube. So Nelson's asking, when I'm speaking in public, I always feel nervous, which make me speak so fast. How can I prevent it? So two things. Number one, more than anything else, you will continue to speak fast if you continue to become nervous. So the root cause is your anxiety. Try to ask yourself, what is causing you to feel nervous about anything that you're about to say? Usually, it's three things. Number one, you're concerned about what other people will think. Number two, you're afraid of rejection. Number three, you probably had a traumatic experience when you were younger and your brain is telling you to not to speak up because it might happen again. You have to tell yourself, so for example, number three, if your issue is about the brain is trying to hold back, you have to tell your brain sometimes, and I do this sometimes, I would say, brain, I know that you have the best intentions of not wanting me to speak up, but this is job related. This is about my promotion. This is about me impressing the boss. I need to speak up. Sometimes I do that self-talk so that I'll be able to muster that courage. Another one is to think about what we know as the spotlight effect. So the spotlight effect is where you have a tendency to think that everyone is looking at you. You have a tendency to think that everyone is watching you and judging you when in fact, not everyone is. They're also busy doing something else in, our, in their lives. So when you think that everyone is looking at you, you become more shy, you tend to hold back, you clam up, and instead of wanting to say something, you feel that if you say it, people might reject you because you don't have the most intelligent idea or because it might offend other people. So you have to let go of that mindset. Not everyone is looking at you. Not everyone is thinking of you. Not everyone is judging you. Everyone is going to judge you anyway because that's part of life. If they are not able to judge you, they will not be able to know if you are an ally or an enemy for their survival. So say it because they will judge anyway. Okay? If you're able to take that out of your mindset, I do think that you will be able to speak slower because you're not anymore afraid of being chased by your anxiety. Now, there's also another tactic for you to speak slower, and that is try to pronounce each syllable clearly. And you already have, I would assume, Nelson, that you're a Filipino. If you are, you already have the advantage because our we do pronounce syllables down to the last uh, sound, down to the last uh, consonant, for example. So that's one way of managing it. Okay, here's also one quick tactic. Record yourself in front of the video. Say something, or if you have an opportunity to ask for permission, during your next Zoom meetings or on-site meetings with other people, ask permission if you can record it. Record it and then watch it over and over again. You'll be surprised. You will discover a lot of things about yourself. You think that when you speak, you speak like X. And then when you watch that video, you realize, wow, I speak like Y. And then you cringe. And that the more you cringe, the more you motivate yourself. I don't want to speak like that. I don't want people to think of me like that. And that's such a strong motivator to finally change and be conscious that when you speak the next time around, you will avoid them or at least minimize repeating them over and over again. Okay? I hope I'm able to answer your question, Nelson. Can I get an exclamation mark, by the way, from our participants if we're learning something so far? Okay, thank you. By the way, could you please give us a like or a heart if you can? It will help us improve our algorithm on Facebook and all the other platforms so we can reach out to more listeners and viewers. Okay. Can I just also raise this? So Jean says the same thing. I got, I have a very low confidence when it comes to speaking in front. So meaning everyone's looking at you, everyone's eyes are on you. That's called the spotlight effect. You start thinking that everyone, everyone is judging you, but you have to let go of the fact that judgment is going to be a bad thing. What's the worst case scenario anyway when people judge you? What? Maybe they don't think that you're smart enough. Okay, then let them be. You will have another opportunity in the future to prove them wrong. Maybe they don't think you're as 
sexy or handsome or beautiful anymore because you're not as intelligent as people think. That's fine. There are 7 billion, 6 billion other people to impress in this world. You have to let go of that mindset because if you keep on thinking that everyone is judging you, you will not be able to proceed doing other things in life. Can I just share this, by the way? When I was 17 years old, I was diagnosed with a small cyst on my right breast. And it dramatically changed my life because I promised myself that if I will be able to get through this small cyst, and eventually, obviously, that's a benign cyst. It wasn't malignant. I didn't have breast cancer, which is so weird for males, by the way. I promised myself that I will no longer be mindful of what other people's judgments are. I will take it as feedback if they think that I have to change something about myself. But if, if it's just small judgments such as, oh, uh, he doesn't look as handsome as he should be, oh, he didn't change his clothes properly, or oh, he pronounces this word wrong, that's fine. And these are judgments that people will always think of because it's part of life. If you're not being judged, it means you're not doing anything that interests or gets the attention of other people. And when that happened to me, it dramatically changed the way I saw life. It also dramatically changed my career. I was bolder. I was more courageous. I was not hesitant to volunteer to do X, Y, and Z, which is also the reason why when an opportunity came for me to join a reality TV show, obviously it's easy to be hesitant, but I said, well, I'm going to do this because it only happens to you perhaps once in a lifetime. The worst case scenario is you'll probably embarrass in front of the television, but the other part of it, if I flip and switch it, is maybe I can win the show, right? So judgment is part of life. It is not our business to worry so much about judgment. It is a natural part of life because everyone has a responsibility to judge others. When you're sitting down in a jeepney or in a bus, your mind auto-judges others. Why? You want to know if this person's sick. You want to know, is this, is this person going to rob you? You want to know if this person is good looking and you want to flirt with this person. So the brain auto detects these things. You can't help it. It's part of life. Okay. I hope that was able to help you guys. So let's cover more questions. I'd like to invite. So I want to answer a question from TikTok, by the way. So I'm going to be asking our participants on TikTok if you could please start typing your questions as well. But let me answer another one here on uh, Facebook. Okay, because Nelson is very active. And here's a follow-up question so that I don't forget about your question anymore, Nelson. Let me answer this as well. Nelson is asking, is it okay not to look into the audience's eyes? Because oftentimes when I look them on the eyes, I forget what to say next. The reason why you feel that way, Nelson, is because when you look at other people's eyes, which are the windows to our soul, you tend to think that you're being judged, which again goes back to your question a while ago. So here's my quick tip. Did you know that you don't really need to look into people's eyes? You just need to look like or appear that you're looking into their eyes. What do I mean? When I talk to audiences that I'm starstruck to talk to, let's say, for example, uh, okay, I'll give you one. This is years and years ago. This was probably 10 years ago. So when I joined The Apprentice, obviously I was inspired by Mr. Bill Rancic, who's the first ever winner of the show way back in 2002 something. And there was an opportunity in Malaysia where I was invited to speak for Maybank and the headquarters of Maybank is in Malaysia. And Bill Rasik was also invited. So the moment I saw him, gosh, I was so starstruck because I was like, I was, was, I was just watching this guy win the show and now I'm here sitting down with him. So it's easy to be starstruck. But what I did was that every time I was speaking to him, I did not look straight into his eyes. I still need to look like I was engaged. So I would look into his cheeks or nose or forehead or mouth. And that's the same thing that I also do to my audiences. When I talk to my audiences, sometimes if you're intimidated, you can just look into the sides, into the spokes, right? You can just look into their cheeks and nose. No one will find out. They will think that you're looking into their eyes, but you're just looking at some other parts. And try to capitalize on that until in the future, you're able to confidently look into people's eyes. 
So Nelson, this is good because this is acknowledging that in order for people to know that your attention is captured, it is important to look into their eyes. Case in point, I hate recruiters in HR who interview you and don't even look into your eye. They're just looking at their resume or they're starting to scroll down on their phone, pretending to be pretending that they're listening. It seems rude. It seems like you're being disrespected, right? So it does matter to look into people's eyes as a speaker, but you don't need to look straight into the eye. You just need to look like you are looking into their eyes. Okay. Karen, by the way, also says this in Facebook. I look at the middle of the nose. That's what I do. That's right. Thank you. Okay, so Nelson says, I've learned a lot. Thank you. Uh, here's a comment from Karen. One thing that I also do to avoid being so conscious about my audience is that I focus on the thought that there's definitely something that they can learn from me. Yes, I love this comment. Thank you. Imagining that I'm training people instead of focusing on the experience of my audience. So people would often ask me, John, as a motivational speaker and as someone who trains for public speaking and confidence building, do you ever get intimidated at all? And my answer is yes, especially if the audience is not familiar. So I've been around in the industry. Some of the weirdest ever audiences I've had, to give an example, this happened before the pandemic. I spoke to a group of gentlemen who are at least 50 to 70 years old, and they were all from East Europe. They were able to speak in English and they were able to understand in English, but not as fluent as you would want them to be. And I knew from the very start, gosh, my jokes are not gonna get through these folks. So I, so I was so intimidated. I was doing a motivational talk. This was for a Rotary Club that was based in Poland. And... I have two options, therefore. One is I switch into anxiety in which, oh no, they will not like me. This is going to be the first time that I will be very, uh, ever embarrassed. They will talk about Jonathan Yabut among the Rotary Club members thinking that I'm not a good speaker at all, that I'm a fake, etc. Or I switch to the other side in which I will say, man, I've never talked to a group of Polish or East European guys age 50 to 70 years old, and there must be a reason why they invited me because they do believe in my abilities. And if I'm able to impart a life lesson that can dramatically change their lives, even for just 30 minutes or an hour, that would be the best gift that I can have in this world. So you have two options. You switch to anxiety or you switch to excitement. And I want to remind everyone in this session that anxiety and excitement is triggered by the same part of your body, right? Your amygdala gets triggered, pumping in to your blood, right? And therefore, your blood pumps in faster so that the oxygen gets circulated because the brain thinks that it has to uh, avoid danger. And that danger is the concept of being embarrassed, the danger of being humiliated in front of an unfamiliar audience. So thank you, Karen, for this uh, comment. It's one thing that is always effective from my end. Okay? And by the way, if you do get nervous before you're able to speak up, think of it as a good thing. Why is it a good thing? If you're nervous about something, it means you care about what you're going to talk about. It means that you care about the audience. If you stop caring for what you're about to do, it means one thing. You're bored. You don't have any purpose behind it. It's the least of what you want to do. Remember, the opposite of love is not hatred. The opposite of love is indifference. You do not care about the person anymore. If you're still mad about a person, if you're still infuriated about a person, it means that a part of you still believes that there is something that can change about them. So there is still a level of love. Okay? Oh, Karen also says, pressure is privilege. Thank you. This is one of my favorite quotes from Billie Jean King, one of the revolutionary tennis players during the 1980s. Okay, here's another question from Donald. Any tips when you suddenly blank out or lose your train of thought while speaking? And how do you recover quickly and less obvious? 
Uh, lots, many, many, I have many tips for this. So one way again, which I mentioned a while ago, it might not be effective all the time, but one way to buy time is to throw the question to the audience and use that time to buy for your answer. So say something like, oof, I'm curious to know first what the other audience members think. Can I first throw it to Anna? Anna, before I answer this question, what do you think of what Miguel said? And of course, deep inside, without looking like you're panicking, think of what your next answer is. Okay? The number two technique, which I think is the safest, is to park that thought. And, and be honest about it and say something like, oof, team, I'm so sorry. I have so many things running in my mind, so many monkeys. I forgot what I'm about to say. I do want to talk about it later on, but let me park that for a while. In the meantime, while I'm thinking of that, while that is being processed in my brain, can I move on to letter B and letter C? So this will depend on the topic you're talking about, but sometimes honesty is the most graceful way to tell people that you're not perfect at all, but you're trying to do something about it. And they will appreciate that. Versus pretending an answer and inventing one that doesn't make any sense, and the smart people in the room will find it out. Okay? So that's one way. You can just you can look at a lot of how celebrities answer this question. Whenever they turn blank, they can just simply say, gosh, I just forgot what I'm about to say. I'm so sorry for that. I have, I'm so excited about this conversation today that I don't know what I was talking about. And sometimes you can even ask support from the audience. Um, is there anyone here who can help me? What, what was I talking about a while ago again? I think I was talking about X, Y, and Z. Okay, That's another graceful way to, to do it. Okay, I hope I'm able to answer your question again, Donald. Can I request for an exclamation mark if we're learning something so far? Okay. All right, let me answer this question again. This one's from Facebook, from Tatenda. Hello, sir. When I talk to my worker, co-worker, I stammer. Like, I feel like my English is not as good. What do I do? If you're not confident to use the specific language, it is natural that you will feel that you will be judged. So the only way for that to happen is you have to upscale your vocabulary. When I was younger, and I think, you know, a lot of Asians will relate to this because we're not native English speakers. We typically have our provincial language and our national language. But the best way to learn is to keep on watching a lot of TV shows and mimic how they speak and understand the context of what they're talking about. So I grew up watching a lot of legal TV shows. Ali McBeal, Suits, How to Get Away with Murder, when I was younger, I would also watch The Practice, Boston Public. These are, these are TV shows wherein there are a lot of conversations that involve life, politics, and religion. And you tend to mimic some of your favorite characters until you're able to discover your own style. When I was also in college, I joined the debate varsity team. And that significantly helped me how to speak confidently using the English language. I would recommend if you have an opportunity to join organizations or clubs like, for example, Toastmasters is one of the friendliest clubs that I do know. They have a policy that you should never shame or humiliate someone who is starting out in the group. They're very supportive. So that's one way. So Tatenda, to make my answer short, there is no other solution nor a shortcut but to keep on practicing. Practice and practice, knowing that you will make mistakes, up until you finally become more confident in speaking it. Also, one good way, try to befriend people who speak in English well. Spend more time with people who speak in English excellently, ridiculously so good in English. Because the more you speak to them on a daily basis, that skill gets siphoned. In Tagalog, mahahawa ka sa kagalingan nila. Okay? That's also another way. That's going to be a faster way. Because if you also surround yourself with friends and colleagues, and again, you may not choose your colleagues, but you can choose your friends. If you surround yourself with friends who speak good English, that will be part of your life as well. Remember, Jim Rohn says it best, 
you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Okay? All right. By the way, speaking of all right, I was doing gym this afternoon. I was with my trainer, but there was another person with another trainer. And the trainer just kept on saying, all right, all right. And me and my trainer were just laughing. And I just realized, I hope I don't speak like that whenever I conduct my workshops. Because I am also guilty. Whenever I record these videos, I also watch it afterwards just to see my points of improvement. And I'm guilty of saying, right, all right. So I need to minimize that. And again, this is one tip I'd like to give everyone. The more you watch yourself, the more you cringe watching yourself, the more you become motivated. I don't want to be like that. I think I can do better than that. I don't want other people to see me again like that. And it creates more courage. It creates more political will from your end to finally change it. Okay? All right. See, I just said it. <laughs> let's give away, before we proceed, let's give away some prizes now. Unfortunately, I can only give this prize, by the way, to those who are in Facebook, LinkedIn, and also YouTube. Oh, I can also give this, sorry. Let's mix things up. I think we can give some uh, prizes as well to our participants. Okay, so I want to give away 500 pesos worth of gift certificates that you can claim in either the website or the official Lazada store of Oso Healthy or Osh. So these are front-flavored snacks made out of dried fruits and vegetables. And I'll be calling out the name of the person who will be able to answer my question quickly in the chat box. So I'm going to be looking at various uh, chat boxes here. First person who gets it right is going to win. Okay. Are you guys all good? May I request for an exclamation mark? Or can I request for a letter R as in ready if you're all ready for this? Okay. Oh, there you go. I'm going to be earmarking some questions. I do have some questions now on TikTok and also on Instagram. Okay. We're good. So my question is, and by the way, you can check Google search if you don't know the answer here. So it's just a matter of who's the fastest to type. My question is, what do you call the fear of public speaking? What do you call the fear of public speaking? First person who gets this wins our 500 peso gift certificate from our sponsor, which is also Healthy or Osh. Marie says anxiety. Anxiety is a very general word. No? Stage fright? Yes, could be. But not everything involves stage fright. If you're talking to someone in Starbucks, it doesn't involve a physical stage. Okay? So what do you call it? So here's a clue. It ends with the word, the, the word phobia, of course. Okay? Public speaking anxiety. Okay? Yeah, creative answer. But the correct answer, ladies and gentlemen, is glossophobia. G-L-O-S-S-O phobia. Who is my winner? I'm looking at all the chat boxes now. I think my first one came from Facebook. And my winner is, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Leila Claire de Guzman. Miss Leila Claire de Guzman, congratulations. You just won 500 peso worth of gift certificates. Leila, for you to be able to claim your prize, I will appreciate if you could please give me a private message so we can send to you the, how do you call this? The email address where you can claim your voucher. Okay. Thank you. May I get an exclamation mark from the chat box? Let's congratulate our winner, Leila. Very good. Thank you. Okay, here's one more. If you guys are cool with this, let's do one more. I want to give away a free ticket. Since we're talking about public speaking here, I want to give away a free ticket for our upcoming workshop on April 29 from 9.30 to 12.30 a.m. at the SMX Convention Center. 
in SM Aura in Fort BGC. This is Boost Your Confidence. It's an online public speaking workshop. The ticket is worth 1,799 pesos. So I want to give away one free ticket. I'm going to be fair. I'll be giving away tickets to all the platforms just so we don't only have one winner. So I'll give one winner for TikTok, one winner for LinkedIn, one winner for Facebook, one winner for Instagram. Is that cool? Yes? Cool with anyone? So may I request for an exclamation mark again, or please give us a like, gives us a heart. If you haven't yet done that, I will appreciate that, please. If you're ready to start, because I'll be throwing my question now. Okay. Yes. All good. Okay. So my question is this. Uh, this is one of my favorite words of all time because it's one of the longest words in the Oxford Dictionary. So the disease, which is pneumono-ultra-silico-microscopic volcanoconiosis, is the fine inhalation of silicon dust from volcano that causes this specific organ of the body to be irritated or to be inflamed, okay? Or to be infected. Tell me what that specific organ is. This is sili uh, pneumono ultra silico microscopic volcano conosis. When I was in grade school, I memorized this. So up until today, I still know it as well. So. Let me call out the winners. We have winners both from Tik, uh, all from TikTok, LinkedIn, Facebook, and also Instagram. So, my winner first from TikTok, ladies and gentlemen. The first one is Jan, Ian, sorry, Ian underscore ED. The correct answer, by the way, is lungs. Okay, lungs. From Facebook, my winner, ladies and gentlemen, is Karen May by Hinting. Congratulations also. And then from LinkedIn, our winner. Let me call out. Our winner from LinkedIn is Kentrix Malapitan. Congratulations. I'm also showing your name on the screen. And finally, on Instagram. I do wish we can have more viewers, by the way, Instagram. So we're starting out. We haven't done Instagram for quite a while. So we want to increase our viewers in the future. My winner is... Ang sagot ni Chuala Love Chip ay nose. Ba't naman nose? Pwede rin, actually. Manapit pa lang. But my winner is Kathy Andas from Instagram. Kathy Andas. The answer is lungs. Congratulations. So for all the winners we just called out, please send me a DM or a private message and we will send you instructions on how to claim your tickets. Please remember that the session is happening on April 29. That is 9.30 to 12.30 p.m. And if you're interested to get tickets, which are still available, we got two weeks more. The early bird rate ends on April 20. You can get tickets from jonathanyabut.com. This is in partnership with SMX Convention Center at Fort BGC in SM Aura. We would love to have you. We normally have 100 participants from different industries, different companies, and we have lots of fun. Okay. All right. Let's proceed. Are you guys ready for the next part? Let's call out now some more questions. Okay. I think we can cover two to three more questions. Oh, Jenderins is asking how much. The early bird rate is 1,299. That's for three hours. And then after the early bird, it goes to 1,799. Okay. We've been doing this since 2018. We've had more than 1,000 students that have attended our sessions on public speaking. Okay. Uh, Edward on Facebook is saying, this is so cute. He says, Visible po ba ako? Yes, I'm actually showing yours. Just so you know, you're visible. Okay. John, as an online English teacher myself, I'm guilty of the all right. And yeah, I tend to watch myself in the recordings.
Can I just request a audio check, mic test? Some people are saying that uh, Anna is saying that she can't hear me. Am I audible? Just want to check. Uh, sabi ni user 0357, mali po bang sabihin yung all right? Is it bad to say all right? Not bad at all. But if you're saying it every 30 seconds or every 15 seconds, it can be irritating. It's not just the word all right. Be conscious of other words. Actually, basically, technically, apparently. So many of us are guilty of using these adverbs. Take it out. Okay? I've been in meetings where in sometimes they have this bucket where in every time that you're guilty of saying actually, you have to put one peso in it. It's okay to use these words once in a while, but using it as your crutch can be irritating to the audience. It also shows that you're insecure, you're afraid, and you're intimidated to share your thoughts. And that's not a good, that's not the sexiest thing to see from someone. Okay. Ayan, we're audible. Let's look for some more questions here. From Instagram, from R. De La Cruz. John, how can you recover from a mistake? The most graceful way for me to recover is to admit that you have made a mistake more than anything else. Inventing and pretending that you did not notice that there was a mistake, there will be someone in the audience who will call you out because they know that you were trying to hide it. That's one. But number two, please remember that every time you're the one speaking in front of an audience, talk is cheap. Even if you say sorry multiple times, the sincerity will not always come across. So number two tip is that after you apologize, you commit to what you're going to do next. I'm sorry that offended you. I just said something that I wish I could have used a different word, but it offended you. And then commit to your next step. Moving forward, the next time that I speak, I will be conscious of who are the people I'm talking to and I will study further what's the profile of my audience. And the reason for this is because if you commit to your next steps, the more the people will know that you're not just here to say sorry, you're here to become better. As they say, don't be sorry, be better. Diba? We've heard that many times also. Okay? This is also where, by the way, the best time to look finally into people's eyes is when you're apologizing. Because there are types of apologies wherein you're looking downward or you're avoiding the person's gaze. But looking into people's eyes, saying it slowly, will show authenticity. Okay? Ooh, there's one more, by the way. I forgot. When you say sorry, acknowledge the pain that you caused to the person. Because here's what we know based on science. Most people, when they are hurt, they don't need you to make amends. They don't even need you to replace what you've broken. Sometimes what they're only looking for is for you to admit that you caused them pain. So highlight it when you're saying it. So say something like, for example, you were late in a meeting. You just arrived and everyone was already speaking. So when you start sitting down, say something like, I'm sorry I was late. I understand that the meeting was not able to start on time and this caused uh, the time of people to be disrupted. Or I knew that this ate people's time even if they came in way earlier. So identifying what was the pain that you caused is part of the sincerity that you want other people to feel. Okay, here's one more from Z Aguinaldo from Instagram. What is the best way to approach someone who hasn't paid their debt? Ooh, oh nga naman, this is part of speaking up. Three things. Number one, before I actually, and this might depend on the amount, but as someone who has shared blessings with others through that, even if you're my relative, I will always put it into documentation. Even if it's just a sheet of paper, even if it's handwritten. Why? It psychologically creates this mindset from the borrower that I am monitoring this. And likely, in a lot of studies, they're more able to pay because this is something that you do not list in water. 
as we say in Tagalog, nini sa tubig, kasi pwedeng kalimutan afterwards. So when you make them documented, the person knows that they're being monitored. That's the first one. Number two, one way to make the person feel that you also need the money back is to explain to them why you need the money back and where they and where exactly are you going to use it. So say something like, Anna, I am requesting if you can finally pay now because I also need to use the money for the tuition fee of my kids. I also need the money finally because I owe money also from someone else. And when you say the reason why, the other person will be able to put themselves into your shoes and be sympathetic about the problem. After all, it was the same reason why they borrowed the money. Okay? These are situations where I think before you use violence or threat, which I will not deny can be effective for some people, I think you should first start with positivity. Be engaging first because the more you start it with threats and violence, you can be easily blocked on Viber, on WhatsApp. And if the person's not living close or near to you, they can easily hide. And this is where sometimes you have to keep your debtors, uh, the people who owe you money, closer to your lives. Okay. I hope I was able to answer your answer, Z. Ooh, okay. Angelica from Facebook. And by the way, please give us a like. Give us a heart if you haven't yet. We'll appreciate your hearts and likes. It will help us improve our algorithm on our social media platforms. So Angelica Samaniego. You have a very beautiful name, by the way, right? It sounds like a, a name of an heiress. So Angelica says, someone said that I'm a monotone speaker, like I'm not expressive when I speak. This made me think that I am not engaging with my audience or I might not have an impact to them when I speak. Any tips to deal with this? Love your question, by the way, because this is a typical issue for a lot of speakers. So when I say monotone speaker, it sounds like this. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jonathan, and I am 38 years old, and I do not want to reach the age of 40 because I feel I'm already getting old. So that's monotone. It sounds like a robot. The reason why it isn't as engaging is because people think that you're not thinking of the words as you speak. It probably is something that you memorized. It probably is something that you're pulling out of a script. You probably hired someone to deliver that, to write that speech for you. And if you notice, when you listen to valedictory address of high school students who read it on a piece of paper, or if you listen to ministers or senators in the Congress and the Congress as well, a lot of them have very monotone way of delivering. Why? Because they are reading their speeches. So Angelica, we call this, by the way, as prosody. That's the element, prosody, P-R-O-S-O-D-Y. And if you happen to attend our Boost Your Confidence session on April 29th, I'm just going to plug, we'll be spending time on this. Prosody is where you need to have an inflection of up and down. There has to be a variety of voice. So if I get excited like this, or if I want to emphasize my words clearly and with uh, caution and with clarity i slow it down because sometimes when you slow down it gets the attention of people because they're wondering if you're about to deliver something that's important or which is which is what i did a while ago was silence for three seconds that's also part of prosody so you have to again it sounds like a person who's excited who's happy who's sad all of these emotions are important to be expressed as a speaker. Because remember, speaking requires acting. Can I get an exclamation mark if you agree with that? Speaking requires acting. You cannot deny that even if you're in a bad mood, but you have to deliver a presentation the next morning, you cannot look like you don't want what you're doing. You went out for a few drinks last night and you're a bit feeling a bit of a hungover, people don't care. They want you to deliver your presentation. You have to act like you're on Red Bull, five cans of it. Speaking is acting. So Angelica, my recommendation for you is that if it's really part of your personality that you just don't get excited easily, you have to embrace the fact that if you're delivering a speech to a critical audience, you have to act it out. 
Of course, you have to balance. So this is where I want you to record yourself in the video. Don't act it out as if you're starting to become a clown or you're starting to become overacting because people will tell. They will be able to find it out. Record yourself in the video multiple times. Do different variety, intensity 10, intensity 5, intensity 4. Watch it afterwards. Share it with your friends and tell them which of these intensities do you think is the most natural for me. And it's a trial and error. Okay? My point here is you have to embrace that speaking involves acting. It is engaging the audience. Okay? And if you want your message to be sent across, you have to get their attention. Okay? Let's look at more questions. Okay, Cram. Let's cover two last two more questions, okay? Cram is asking, hello, how do you usually respond to a person who asks a question beyond your topic? Like, what are your sentiments to the government or to the officials? Any tips, Pusana? Two easy things. Number one, I will say something like, I would love to answer your question. However, this time is dedicated for topic X, and I want to make sure that the audience are able to maximize my presence by answering the relevant questions. Let's talk about what your question is later offline after this session. So this way, you get to avoid the awkwardness if you happen to talk about politics that you want to avoid. And also, you go back to the north of the conversation, which is the topic was about A. Let's stick to A. Maria has this, it's a, it's a basic question as well. Uh, what's the basic step in effective public speaking? Is it reading aloud will help? I strongly discourage people to speak loud if it's not necessary. You should only speak loud if you have a big audience and you know that your voice will not reach others. But if you're only talking to two or three people and they're right in front of you, speaking loud can be rude. It will make me think, do you think I'm deaf? Do you think I'm not understanding what you're saying? The more you're calm, the more you're soft-spoken, especially when your audience is in front of you, the more you seem to be in control and the more confident you appear to the listeners. Okay? Nick Nick, here's your notice statement. Thank you for also watching our session today grace is asking what do you do if some of the audience members are scanning you from head to toe do you tell them to stop or just proceed by the way this is maybe the tito and me some people write this in the message tia so tia and i'm like tia what does that mean and then i only learned last week that in the social media universe Tia means thank you in advance. Okay, so Grace, two things. Number one, are you even 100% sure that they are scanning you from head to toe? Because sometimes that's our paranoia, which again is the spotlight effect. Maybe they're just appreciating you. They're scanning you, but not in a negative way. They like your clothes. They, your shoes remind them of the shoes of their mother. And it's not a bad thing. So you have to let that go. Okay? Focus on what you need to deliver. Because two days from now, or maybe six hours from now, you will forget about that part of your life. So why should you spend more than a minute minding other people's business? Okay? I will never stop. I will just proceed. If it's really true that they're judging you and you heard them whisper to their office, ah, look at her clothes. It's so badooey. Or look at her shoes, it's tattered, etc. That's their problem. Because it has nothing to do with your performance, with what you're about to say. Okay? Don't let them rent space inside your head. Unless they're the ones paying for the rent inside your head, don't let them stay there for too long. You have other things. Remember, Eleanor Roosevelt says this, no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. So if you do feel judged, Who's at fault? It's you. 
because you're the one who decides whether that judgment is something that you need to spend more time on. Okay? Are we cool with that? So Vivian, please let go of that mindset. Okay? The more you think of what other people think about you, ikaw ang talo. Okay? 48 hours later, that person has already forgotten you. Six hours later, that person probably doesn't even remember you. And here you are still thinking about it. Sinong talo? It's you. I immediately move on. There are other dragons to slay in this world. And I will spend more time to slay my dragons to where my success matters. Okay? All right. We have lots of folks joining on Instagram as well. Thank you for joining us for Supertons, Jazz, Hafiz, thank you. So same thing also for our TikTok, okay? So I can really say that people are finally getting off from work because now we have lots of viewers, especially on TikTok. Okay, sabi ni Kilat, finally nakawatch na ako ng live mo. Thank you for joining our session. Okay, let's hunt for more questions. And I'd like to request, by the way, our TikTok folks, same thing our Instagram folks, please keep those questions coming. Oh, I think I can extend for a few more minutes because my, my client is running late for dinner and is asking if I can do it for another. Yeah, okay, we can do that. Oh, I love this remark. This is from Nick Nick on Facebook. And Nick Nick says, listening consistently with other good speakers can be a great factor to improve your speaking skill. And that's the reason why I'm here. Ah, okay, thank you for joining. This is so true. So some of my favorite speakers, Angela Duckworth, who's the author of Grit. Um, I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek. I do love how he, there's so much passion to how he speaks. Uh, my mom is a big fan of Gary Valenciano. And I'm a big, I'm not a fan of all his music, maybe because I didn't grow up with it. I do, some, I do like some of his songs. But I do think that Gary Valenciano, from a Philippine perspective, is a very confident speaker. Whenever he speaks, the way he moves his hands, right? Try to listen to his interviews. It speaks so much passion that kahit anong sabihin niya, even if he's just selling ball pen or a pineapple, you feel like you want to buy what he's selling. So again, you borrow. You try to watch and emulate other speakers and try to... See if you can also imitate it, but not to the point that you are mimicking it 100%. So you borrow, you create your own style until you have found your own style of doing it. Okay? So kumbaga, it's like trial and error in clothes. Sa umpisa, you're not so good in wearing clothes, but do ka magsuot. You don't know if this is fashionable enough. And then you look at other people on Instagram or Pinterest on how people wear clothes. You try it on your own until you discover your own style. Public speaking is also like that. Okay? It's a trial and error. When I was younger, when I was in college, my biggest enemy was that sometimes in order to get my message across, I end up going around circles, meaning I will repeat the sentence twice, I will use longer adverbs, and then... I realized later on that this disengages the audience because sometimes all that they want is to get a yes or no in 20 seconds. Bakit ko papapahabain? Why would I beat around the bush? Okay, let me answer this question now from TikTok only because I think it's an easy one. It's not related to our topic, but let me answer this quickly. So, CYP on TikTok is asking, how much increase I should expect if promotion is offered at work? Speaking of promotions, usually it will depend on your position. If you're coming from a associate position, at 10 to 15, sometimes companies can be as generous as 20% increase is going to be good. But if you're coming from a higher position wherein the absolute value of your salary is already high, it could be as low as 5% or as high as 10%. So 
So I hope you understand my mathematics here. If you're earning 1 million pesos, you can't get 20%. That's too high. You'll probably only get 5 or 3% because even a 3% increment is already high. Okay? Okay. Ooh, okay. Let me answer this. Lane Baggio from Facebook is asking, how do you handle audience distra uh, distractions, I think you mean. Not destruction as in damage. Huh? Distraction, D-I-S-T-R-A-C-T-I-O-N. So first of all, there are many ways of, dis of identifying distraction. An example of a distraction in the audience, which I often encounter, someone at the back of the room is speaking so loudly with their seatmate that it distracts me from what I'm saying. You know what's the easiest way to manage that? Speak closer, walk beside them, and walk up to the point that they will notice that you, you are approaching them. So for example, if the person is here, I will walk and I will position myself here. And then I will keep on talking to the audience. I will not call out the attention of this person. But the moment you stay close to them, they will have an idea, and I hope they do have an idea. They're smart enough. They will have an idea that you're coming closer to them because they're speaking too loud. Okay. Another way why that's effective is because when you go closer to this person, all of the other audience members are going to position their eyes towards you. That includes the other person. So the other person now will feel embarrassed that they're speaking too loud because the attention is towards their area. So that helps it. I often do this so that I don't embarrass the person. Because sometimes if you call someone from the audience, unfortunately, you look like you're the enemy. Okay, I don't want to be that high school teacher who embarrasses their participants in a violent manner as if you're scolding them. So that's one. Number two, another way of distraction that I often encounter is if someone asks a question but their question is attacking your personality. Or if the person doesn't want to agree with you, okay? To the point that their disagreement provoked them. So for example, have I ever experienced this in my career? Did someone, ah yeah, I, th I think I did. So this was a person who did not agree with my tip, with my, so what I, I was saying, I can't remember what I said, but the person was so mad. She was so mad to the point that she said, no, 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 no. We cannot proceed with this discussion until you admit that that is not a good thing to say. And yet all the other members of the audience members were agreeing with me. So she was the only one who was in disagreement. So I said at the end of the conversation, let's agree. Let's disagree to agree. You may have your own thoughts. I think the audience members think otherwise, but I would love to talk this out with you. Maybe during coffee break or during lunch break, if you have time, let's discuss about your thoughts. Okay? So this is me telling her that we cannot spend too much time on this because there are other things to talk about. But at the same time, I'm not dismissing them. Because the more you dismiss someone, the more that they think that you're not open-minded to admit that other opinions also count. Okay? Uh, third, sometimes the best way to solve distractions is to mitigate them from the very start. So when I conduct workshops, I will often tell the organizers, these are the only times that we can allow coffee break or for the servers to come to offer the food. Because usually that sound of the fork and spoon and plates will irritate me because I will be distracted. Also, uh, another way is if you have the stage... Or if you have, you know, even if it's just a group of 10 people, try to look at the surroundings of the room and try to keep other items that might distract them. So for example, a coffee station, if it is situated at the stage or near the stage, is going to cause a lot of distractions because people will come and go frequently. Put the coffee station at the back. Okay? These things are so petty. Mukha silang mababaw. But if you're able to manage them, it makes the entire meeting smoother also. So 
Karen also says that set the rules before you start. Another way is if you're limited, if your time is limited to deliver that talk or a presentation, and questions will always distract. Say something like, team, I will expect that you have a lot of questions to ask. However, I'm going to reserve the end of the meeting as the Q&A portion so that we get to finish everything first. And the reason for that is because if you will keep on entertaining questions in the middle of your meeting, you will not be able to end your presentations at all. Okay? All right. Let's, can I just cover last two? Last two more. Because I also need to walk first my dog before I go for my meeting. I love this question because I can so relate to this. This is from Rodel Lawas on TikTok. And Rodel says, how can I speak with credibility when they think that I'm too young and inexperienced because I happen to be a young manager? This is one of, this remains to be my insecurity up until today. And I think it's because in the Philippines or in many parts of Asia, they often equate wisdom with white hair. They often equate wisdom with someone who's in their 50s or in their 40s. I'm 38 years old this July. And some people still think that I'm 28 because they cannot let go of the fact that I came from Apprentice Asia when I was in my 20s. And it's already 10 years old. So I'm, you know, 27 plus 10. It means I'm 37 now. But a lot of them still think that I'm 24 years old. So I feel so insecure because sometimes whenever I do briefing with clients, some of them would still ask, John, if I may ask, before we conduct this leadership training, may I ask how old you are? Because majority of our participants are 40s and 50s. So I that would usually make me snap. And a part of me is triggered because that question assumes that I will not be able to teach about leadership if I happen to be younger. However, and here's where I want to answer the question of Rodel here. The feeling of inferiority will only get to you if you allow it. And again, I will mention what I said a while ago from Eleanor Roosevelt. No one can make you feel inferior without your permission. So if you allow this feeling of provocation to affect you, it will change the way you answer the questions. So I will, I change that anxiety again into excitement. And what's the excitement? The excitement is, ha, these guys are underestimating me. I can see it from their eyes. I can see it from their questions. And I also know that every time this happens, as long as I do a good job, mapapanga nga sila afterwards. And when I think of that vision, when I think of that vision we're in, they're all just dumbstruck, knowing that I did a good job and I prove them wrong. When I think of that vision, it makes me more excited, wanting to prove them that you guys judge me wrong. So that excitement becomes a motivation for me to even do better. That excitement becomes a reason for me to work 10 times harder. Okay? So youth is always... And by the way, I will not take it personally if ever they do. You know why? Because the person's judging you because they care about the event. I'm also guilty of this. I remember 2019, I went to a dentist... And when I saw the dentist, she looked so young. She looked like a college student. And when I opened my mouth and she was about to put some of the tools into my teeth, I said, wait, 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 are you the doctor? I said that. And then it came into my mind, gosh, I'm also judging this person. So I'm also doing the same thing that my clients are also doing to me. Why? Because judgment is automatic. We judge people because we care about what's about to happen. It's an autopilot mode. It's part of our brain. It's hardwired in our brain to think like that. So I, whenever I feel that I'm judged, I think about the moments that I also judge. Okay? Let's do one more. Okay, one last question before we end.
before I cover a question, sabi ni Jordan, do you have a leadership talk in Cebu? We're about to release our dates for our partnership with SMX Convention Center for both Cebu and Davao happening in June and July. Please stay tuned for that. You can check our website, jonathanyabut.com for our calendars. We'll be announcing that sometime in May. Okay. Give me one more. I'm looking for... Can I just answer this question again? Nothing to do with public speaking, huh? Sorry. But I get, you know, I get so passionate answering this question. Eh? Someone says, is it right to resign because of a toxic boss? Science tells us that most of us resign because of the boss, not because of the job. Because the boss defines the relationship between you and your work. Okay? I do discourage you, however, to resign immediately because if there are other amazing things in your company that you think you will no longer be able to have if you move to a different company, you might regret it later on. Amazing salary, amazing teammates, amazing training opportunities. And there are moments wherein you might just have this toxic boss only for a few months. You can get rotated to a different department. You can ask permission from HR if you can move to a different team. That's also an option that you can take. Okay, Don't let a person decide what your career should be. Don't get me wrong. If you have exhausted all means, you've talked to HR, you've looked for opportunities outside the team, but still within the company, and you can't take all of these, you still don't have a chance of claiming them, then as long as you can tell to yourself that I have done everything from my power, then that's the time that I think that you have the rights to leave. Okay? Talagang every time I do these kinds of live, no, mayroon talagang papasok about quitting. <laughs> and again, I've been telling my team, we can't do live sessions all about quitting because I don't want to be known as that person who just keeps on telling people to quit. Okay? Quitting is the new winning if it will lead you to a better life. But quitting should be done at the right time and at the right place and for the right reasons. I don't want our generation, the millennials and the Generation Z, to think na konting problema lang sa buhay, quit agad. That's not winning. That's giving up. Okay? And neither should we hold the mental card and say, oh, mental wellness, mental health. No. We have to stop saying that everything is about our mental health. There are moments in life where you have to give sacrifices. There are moments in life where you have to take in some pain. Okay? You, we, we need to learn to take in some of those pain for us to be stronger. Otherwise, by the time that you reach your 30 or 40, hindi mo na kaya. Okay? And if you want to continue living a better life, you have to increase your threshold for pain. Okay. Okay, one more? Oh, one last talaga ha, because I need to leave na. Okay, let me answer this question. This one's from YouTube again. Oh, my dog is barking now because we're about to leave for, for a walk. Okay, let's answer this question now. Okay, the YouTube question's a bit... Okay, okay. I think this one's a good one. What are your rituals before speaking in front of a crowd? Nothing, nothing magical. And a lot of them are the same tactics that a lot of speakers do. Number one, I rarely sit down for the longest time. Sometimes I do if I don't have any choice. But as much as I can, I will stand up. And the reason for that is if you sit down for too long. If you know, By the way, my, can I just show my dog now? Because he's starting to... Oh, Tanji. You want to be shown again on stage? Let me just... Uh... Oh, yeah, he wants to be shown now. There, there you go. Okay. So, number one, I will not sit down because if you sit down, your testosterone level goes down. If you make yourself look that you're clamming down, you're, you're shutting yourself down, your body feels less excited. Your body feels more passive. And you don't want to be in that situation when you're about to speak and address an audience. So I will stand up. 
I would usually do what they call as the superwoman or the, uh, sorry, superman or the wonder woman pose. So you're standing up like this. And this is very important because it makes you feel courageous. It makes you feel that you're about to conquer the world. If you need to roll up your sleeves, do that as well. If you're in the Philippines, by the way, if you notice, during the elections, uh, Grace Poe was well known for that. When she gets into debates, she would roll up her sleeves because that's her way of trying to muster courage when she's about to deliver a speech. Okay, So I will always stand up. Expanding your body is an important gesture to make yourself look, com look confident. If you're about to do a job interview, do not sit down for too long. If you know that you're about to be called out soon, stand up, pace around the corridors or get a newspaper, spread it like an eagle, and make yourself look make yourself look expanded to make yourself look confident. Okay? Another ritual, ooh, I do this as much as I can. I will talk to the audience members. I will grab my cup of coffee at the back and then while I'm stirring my cup of coffee, by the way, I had a cup of coffee and it's still full because I forgot to drink it. It's not any more hot. I would stir my cup of coffee and wait for people to come to the coffee stations. And then usually people will say hi because they recognize you. But it's also my opportunity to ask questions about what are your expectations about this event? Where do you come from? Uh, what's your department? Because the more you get to know audience members, the more you feel comfortable that you know someone in the crowd. Very important to her. When you know someone in the crowd, you feel like you're just talking to your friends and you feel less judged. And so making a connection before you go on stage is very important. Okay. Third, last thing that I would do, this might not be applicable for everyone, but I get easily distracted and irritated by technicals. When I say that PowerPoint is not functioning, projector is not turning on properly, the clicker does not have the right batteries or naubuso na ng batteries, or the clicker cannot uh, reach the laptop because you're too far away. These things are important because they're so basic. So even if my focus is about delivering the speech or delivering the meeting right, I manage these parts because I don't want awkward moments during my talk. You know those moments wherein the projector dies and you have one minute or two minutes of not doing anything else and you're forced to crack a contest or joke, I want to minimize those things to happen. So sometimes you cannot trust and leave this in the hands of the technical team. Because I will say this, sometimes the technical team is just incompetent or they don't care about their jobs. Do not let them decide what happens to your speaking engagement. Okay. So check the laptop, check the PowerPoint slide, check the font, check the, this happens, and this is stupid. Your laptop is there, but you forgot to plug it to the charger. And then after speaking for an hour, the laptop dies. And it will take five minutes to reset the laptop. You don't want that to happen. So that for me is one of the most important aspects before I also speak. Okay. I hope you were able to learn something for today's session. Could you please give us an exclamation mark? Could you please give us a like, a heart, if you're able to learn something? We'll continue more of our discussion within this week. We'll go, I am not anymore going to put a time on the live session so that I can predict my time better because we have other talks also. But within this week, I will do a lot of multiple live sessions when we have time. And it's also a way for me to distress. Okay. So we hope you get to enjoy the session. If you're interested to join our workshops, if you'd like to learn more hands-on with an audience or with a group of your colleagues, you can come to our April 29 session at SMX Convention Center in Fort BGC. April 29, 9.30 a.m. is Boost Your Confidence. That's about public speaking. And in the afternoon, 2 to 5 p.m. is Email Etiquette and Business Writing. Log on to jonathanyabut.com, go to the talk section, and you can register and enroll. Everything is there, down to the payment. We hope to see you guys soon. Bye.